still had Jim Thompson. We had a new pro ERA uh, still had Jim Thompson. But when that didn't work, I mean, you tried to play fair. You tried to play within the Democratic Party. Right. And that didn't work. So two years later, what did you do? Well, two years later, we actually talked to 26 Democrats in Alexandria about challenging Jim Thompson. <coughs> Excuse me, where is the microphone? About challenging Jim Thompson in the primary, and none of them would do it. And at that point, was he Speaker of the House? Yes. No, no, he was House Majority. House Majority Leader. Okay. So that he was Harry Byrd's brother-in-law. Uh, he, he was the most powerful political figure in Virginia, um, and so that point, a member of the Democratic Committee, and I think I'm going to name names now. It's time to start naming names. names. Kate Brooks. Who remembers Kate? Oh, Brooks? Yeah. oh, right. daughter, daughter-in-law of Kate Brooks. Yes, right. Kate Brooks was a member of the Democratic Committee in Alexander, representing Mount Vernon precinct. She knew Jeff Wayne Scott, who was the chair of the Republican Party in Alexandria, and Kate called Jeff and said, "We're looking for we being Vera, our little bit Vera group." Uh, we're looking for a candidate to run against Jim Thompson, and we can't find a Democrat. Do you have a Republican? And Jeff said, uh, pro ERA Republican. Although I would have settled for an anti ERA Republican just to knock Thompson out of the power. You mean anybody but Thompson? Anyone but Thompson. 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 Right. Pink elephant. Right. We vote for a pink elephant. Pink elephant, that's what we said. We vote for a pink elephant. Uh, but, and they had nobody. But then, uh, subsequently, uh -oh. this young lawyer Republican in town, Gary Myers, called Jeff Wayne Scott and said, I think I want to get involved in local politics and was thinking maybe I'd run for city council. And Jeff Wayne Scott said, how about how the delegate? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, but, but, but you'd have to be pro ERA. And apparently Gary said, well, I, I never gave it much thought, but yeah, I, I can be pro ERA. <laughs> and then and Jeff said, there's a group of women I want you to talk to. So we met with uh, Gary at Susan and Aiken's house. And oh, I disagreed with him on everything except for Gary. And they finally pulled me out of the room. I was they were afraid I would was discourage him from running because he's so bad on everything else. <laughs> but um, yeah, he agreed to run and the, and the women in Alexandria agreed to mount a size, sizable and significant campaign on his behalf and Dick Hobson's behalf. So at that point we had Democrat and Republican. Two seats that represented Alexandria. Plus, we had the additional challenge that election, if you remember, because the floater seat that Alexandria and Arlington shared was vacant, and so part of our strategy was to elect our, the woman who had been our chief lobbyist for the NRA directly to the House that day on the sign. And so that election was successful. And at the end of the day, on election day, 1977, Jim Thompson. I remember the I remember I remember us in the in the, the headquarters and I remember all the stats going up on the wall and people cheering, cheering, cheering. And then when the news came out that Jim was about to concede, which hmm. took like about an hour, I remember us running screaming down the Alexandria to the Lyceum uh, to hear the concession speech. And I also remember you talking to him in a what seemed to me to be a very civil and actually kind way. You know, I, I think you said, "I I'm sorry, Jim, but this is the way it had to be." You know, it, it, that's reminded me, Georgia. Okay, back up to '75 Democratic primary, and um, and, and again the, the the victory or defeat party was in the Lyceum, and so I went. I was on the Democratic committee. Had been the I'm sitting there very disconsolate. I don't even remember what I had on. And, and Jim came over and sort of kissed me on the top of my head. And he said, don't worry, Marianne. Every year, you run a little bit faster. And every year, I run a little bit slower. And one of these years, you're going to get, get me. And I screeched. <laughs> Must we add condescension to defeat? <laughs> So when we marched to the Lyceum that night, two years later, two years and some months later, I went up to Jim Thompson and I said, "Let me remind you <laughs> of what you told me a little over two years ago, which was that 
every year I run a little bit faster, and every year you run a little bit slower, and at one of these years I was going to get you. I am sorry that this year is that year, and that tonight is that night, but you let me no other choice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what he said. Oh, I just had forgotten all about that. <laughs> and he was very gracious and defeated. One of but, but his colleagues were not. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I remember about that election, and it was my first election day working, and I was assigned, I think, six or seven precincts up the West End of Alexandria to run around and take sandwiches to and whatever else she did. And you know, as was said at Jean's memorial service today, women are the heart of the Democratic Party. And I observed the strangest thing. There apparently was a shortage of wooden campaign sign stakes in Virginia that year. And I would go to precinct after precinct after precinct. And there would be a whole bunch of stakes for whoever, and a whole bunch of signs up for Elise, and a whole bunch of signs up, you know, for, for Hobson. And poor Jim, they must have run out of stakes. <laughs> because he had one sign at every precinct, and that was it. <laughs> They just didn't have enough stakes to go around. Oh, that's too bad. I don't think the women meant to run away. <laughs> Not those good Democratic women. The, the other one, somebody at Jane's Memorial yeah, Service yeah. talked about going, working that, that 77 election in, at Elise's house. And Carrie, I remember, Carrie, Carrie, Carrie did it. And I remember that election in that we had the mimeograph machine and the letter inserter and everything downstairs. And the women could go upstairs to do mail, some mailings, but mostly we could go downstairs. And the Democrats were kept upstairs because we were working for Gary Myers. We had Gary Myers stuff there as well as Democratic stuff. And so the, the, the Democratic women, I don't think ever really carried the sort of an inner circle there. Uh, most of them didn't have a clue that we were printing green mimeographing in the basement. Well, it's interesting how Carrie said it. She said, I found myself in the basement. I found myself in the basement. <laughs> Because yeah. Yeah. not too many of those Democrats do I recognize. But, not from downstairs. But, but you're listening to the, the um, experiences that you recount from, I said just a few years earlier before we entered into this really intense political time, I, I've always felt some, I don't know if guilt is the right word, but I was never quite sure it was the right thing totally to have done to so. Uh, focused the women's movement in Virginia on the amendment and on the electoral process. I, I did it because that was my goal was to write about the amendment. And so I just pulled everybody in that I could, but after it was all over, I wasn't sure that that was really the best and healthiest thing for the movement overall. I never really resolved that in my mind. Because politics can be very enticing. Oh, yes. Addictive. Addictive. I would. I, you know, I, quite frankly, I chose not to use that word because we just came from Jean's service. And there's that whole issue of was she addicted to food or did she just, was the food enticing to her? So I chose not to use the addiction. But yeah, it, it uh, But I mean, we were just talking Mary, before Mary, you came. I don't think you should no. feel the least no. bit concerned uh, and definitely not guilty because. We trusted your expertise in that sphere of action that needed to be done. And we worked in other spheres of action, you know, to complement. We felt we were complementing each other. We were just talking about that this area was one of the few that didn't split. And, and the people didn't say, you shouldn't be doing that, Georgia. You should be doing politics. You did politics. Yes, you enticed some of us in very badly for some of us. <laughs> but she, but she made me eat lentil soup the whole <laughs> last year. We were so broke. I had not touched a lentil since then. <laughs> Was that the recipe that I gave you for lentil soup? I don't know, but but it, I, I felt that Georgia had influenced it because that's what a mess of cottage in the Bible yes. is. It's lentil <laughs> soup. So it's all Georgia's fault. <laughs> well, where did the jello come? <laughs> hey, you know, we were poor. We ate I have to soup. look that up in the concordance for my Bible where it talks about jello. <laughs> but you did, the, the one thing that the political group didn't do was to say the other stuff, what didn't matter. 
You just said, this is what I want to do, come join me. As opposed to, you should, there were no you shoulds to anybody else. And that's one of the things that made the whole Northern Virginia area strong. Yes. And I think the politics complemented you know, the lobbying and vice versa. I, 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 think I think one reified the other. Yeah. And during that same time period, because I was uh, head of the uh, Women and Religion Task Force for the National Organization for Women, I was working on the ordination of women in the Episcopal Church. And there was the old line women's group that started out as the Altar Guild, which we might say would correspond to the League of Women Voters. Uh, there was the group that wanted to work on ordination for political action. There was the group that wanted to work on ordination through education. And then there were the ones that said, to hell with it, I'm just going to go get ordained. And they didn't talk to each other. And to a large degree, they didn't respect each other. Um, and so that, that, is, that is the normal pattern. And that was contemporaneous with what we were doing. And we didn't fall into that. And when I worked with women in the Roman Catholic Church, you know, I have I have always counseled them against that kind of splitting. Now there were individuals that would bridge those groups. And it was very costly for them because neither group trusted them to a Pause for a break and, and yeah, we'll get a drink. Walk around. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody want wine? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah.